the first step of putting alcohol down is recognizing that my life was unmanageable and I couldn't live like that anymore. And the same thing happened four months ago when I was trying to keep working sometimes 12 hour days because I wanted to do my job and I wanted to be successful. And I had just reached the point where I was doing the thing that I had aspired to do, but my head hurt so bad. I couldn't live like that anymore. And I sat out on my front porch and I just started crying and I was like, I can't live like this anymore. And I had to walk away. So I've had to do it twice. And, um, it's like my sobriety was practice so that I could prepare for how to live with my vision impairments in a way that does not reignite all of my mental health issues. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to the Recovery After Stroke podcast, The Final Touches on my book. Before it goes live, keep coming, change a word here, remove a line there. And it really is a testament to the exceptional work being done by all the people involved to ensure that the end product is professionally presented and of high quality. To celebrate the end of the four-year journey from concept to almost a book, I'm giving away the first chapter free. The book is called The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened, and it shares 10 secrets from stroke survivors that will transform your life. If you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book and fill out the form, you will receive the book in your email inbox a few moments later. This is episode 274, and my guest today is Rachel Miller, who is living with vision loss after stroke and is hoping to connect with other stroke survivors that are experiencing the same thing. If you would like to connect with Rachel, you can visit the show notes at recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes and find all, all of her contact details there. If you leave a comment on the YouTube video of this episode, I will ensure to pass on your information to Rachel and connect you. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your stroke experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor who wants to share your story in the hope that it will help somebody else who's going through something similar. If you are a researcher who wants to share the findings of a recent study, or you are looking to recruit people into studies, you may also wish to reach out and be a guest on my show. If you have a commercial product that you would like to promote that is related to supporting stroke survivors to recover, there is also a path for you to join me on a sponsored episode of the show. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the form explaining briefly which category you belong to, and I will respond with more details about how we can connect via Zoom. Rachel Miller, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. Thank you for being here, reaching out. Tell me a little bit about your stroke story, because there's more to your story than just stroke. Yeah, there is. Um, thank you, first of all, for um, allowing me to share my story. Um, I've been trying really hard to um, to share my story so that I can possibly find somebody who has the um, neurological vision impairments that I do. I've had a hard time finding that. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be a part of your podcast. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my story actually starts with alcoholism and, um, I'm seven years sober over seven years sober. And, um, gratefully I have that time working a program that, uh, the day that I had my stroke on June, 2021, um, I had a foundation for what to do in recovery, but this is very different, very mm -hmm. different than, uh, recovering from alcoholism. So, um, yeah. Do you want to hear about 
what happened for the stroke. Yeah, just give me a bit of a an understanding of how it happened or what happened, and then uh, we'll go sure. into the rest of it. Sure. Um, so I was working that day, and um, I had gone outside the front door to uh, take my Weimaraner out to uh, go to the bathroom. And um, I was standing outside waiting for her, and um, uh, we were just talking before the podcast about uh, my ability to entertain myself. Well, part of that is me talking to myself. You know, I think we all do it, but I was talking to myself, kind of whispering to myself, thinking about what I needed to do for work and stuff, and um, and all of a sudden, what I was thinking was not what was coming out of my mouth I I couldn't form the words like I there was nothing wrong with my thinking but it just wasn't coming out right and I just had this moment of panic and so I went inside and um and talked to my boyfriend and my son and I told them I couldn't talk you know I said I can't talk and um and they looked at me like I had three heads you know um I was 46 years old uh with a history of alcoholism and a history of um mental health issues so for me to walk in and say I can't talk it's probably like huh what's going on with her now you know <laughs> um but I quickly was able to I read, I tried to read a piece of paper and, um, and I knew what the word said, but I couldn't say it. Um, so immediately my boyfriend took me to the hospital, which is 15 minutes from here. Um, as soon as I came in, they, uh, they hooked me up and, uh, gave me an MRI, found out I was still having the stroke, um, and they had somebody, uh, they wheeled in a guy on a TV screen from Georgetown Hospital, and ex uh, they did some testing on me. He kind of uh, guided the nurses in the room how to test me and um, concluded that I was having the stroke and that I needed a clot buster immediately. Um, you know, it's interesting that we uh, were in the middle of having a stroke and yet we're in charge of making those life-changing decisions at the same time. They were asking me, um, do you want the clock bu clot buster? Um, with hesitation after hearing some of the, uh, the statistics for brain bleeds and stuff that can happen from a clot buster, um, you know, it, 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 it was only going to get worse if I didn't get it. So I went ahead and, and got it. And it was serious business. You know, they all come in, they're looking at the clock and, and, and um, there's one guy in charge of um, <clears throat> writing down my symptoms. There's another lady looking at the clock. There, there's another guy, like it was, it was very uh, scary. It was very scary. And um, so for about an hour, um, he continued to talk to me and and uh, coincidentally kept trying to have me talk about my dog, my Weimaraner, because I couldn't say the word Weimaraner. Um, so by the end of the hour, I was able to say Weimaraner again. And, um, and so time went on. What I did not realize that had happened was I had a neurological vision impairment. That was the result. And it really didn't, I didn't understand what was happening for, uh, for a while. I mean, a couple weeks and uh, the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. I had a headache. I had a, a headache that just wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And they kept trying to give me Tylenol. They gave me a leave. They gave me uh, Percocet, which side note, that's very dangerous for an alcoholic, somebody who uh, is easily addicted. Uh, nothing worked. So I still, um, as of a month ago, my headache finally subsided with uh, some migraine injections. 
So it's been uh, two years that I've had a headache. <laughs> wow. Is that like a world record? I think it is. I think it is. Yeah, it was. Um, there's an underlying headache. And then the more my vision is aggravated by movement. Um, for example, I'm looking above my computer instead of at it. Mm. And that's because uh, it causes my head to hurt. Uh, yeah. It's it's yeah. an underlying headache. But the more that I aggravate it, it becomes like sharp pains yeah. in my head. I'll get nauseous. Um, it's really, it's terrible. But we finally found something that that's um making an impact on it so hopefully that'll continue yeah sounds like a bit of a drama uh with the screens because i know what that's like i have a light above my head here on the right i have one on the left i have two monitors in front of me and the third one yeah recording is happening and it's it is hard to do an hour and then walk away feeling okay the the, the head does yeah for a normal person <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then the head does get over stimulated the the lights and all of that stuff, the especially fluorescent lights do cause neurological mm -hmm. discomfort, I suppose the word is so that's normal. Um, I, I was really bad early on after my brain surgery. Oh. And, and it kind of got better over time, it was I was able to spend more and more time in front of a monitor. Um, okay, to the point where I was doing a, a normal, you know, work day. But it's quite a drama uh, for people who have had a stroke, especially if you have vision impairments. So tell me what the vision impairment m is like compared to normal vision. So how has it changed? Yeah, um, so after I had my stroke, uh, when I saw my, my uh, primary care physician, she she said that my symptoms were very similar to somebody that had a concussion. So she recommended things like sending me to a concussion clinic and, and also recommended um, easing me back into work. My job is a, was a marketing director, so it was all digital. And um, so easing me back into work by working about 15 minutes, taking a two hour break, working 15 more minutes, taking a two hour break. And then over uh, a couple months that I was on short term disability, we just kept increasing that by about 15 minutes. And um, what would happen is I would get this feeling. It's the best way I can describe it it felt like I had rubber bands wrapped around my head, like a hundred rubber bands and they were just squeezing my head. Um, and I went to an optometrist who diagnosed me with uh, like the inability to like track movement and then also convergence, inability to converge images. That was the optometrist diagnosis. Um, I feel like there's something more happening I, I, because I can't even look at a computer screen without getting aggravated, uh, you know, my head getting aggravated, whether the, the screen is black with white writing on top, you know, and I'm just looking at a Word document mm -hmm. or it's uh, looking at you while we're talking. I don't, I no longer, um, I haven't watched TV in four months. Um, imagine missing Big Bang Theory for four months. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also can't drive, uh, ride in the car, uh, ride a bike. I have a problem walking long distances because the earth moving in front of me uh, makes me nauseous and makes me feel a little off kilter. Uh -huh. So the Big Bang Theory, you know, it's in the 10th season of its repeats, right? It, it doesn't. Yeah. You're not I missing still watch on it <laughs> every not... day. <laughs> I can't do without it. I've even told my boyfriend that we need to just turn it on so I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Because I just wanted to make sure you weren't 
concerned that you were missing out on the next <laughs> episode. That I'm missing or... anything new. <laughs> no. Nothing new. I'm really on cool. like watching each each episode for the hundredth time. I yeah, love yeah. that show. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like uh have you spoken to a neuro ophthalmologist? So uh the a neuro ophthalmologist. No. Okay. I, I'm going to a get a neuropsychiatric exam in December. Mm-hmm. I've been waiting for that for months. Um, I've gone to a neurologist and an optometrist, but not a neuro optometrist. Yeah. So the neuro ophthalmologist will be somebody who deals with vision issues related to neurological. Uh, Uh, deficits so things that are caused by the brain that cause vision issues because technically the ophthalmologist will look at your eye he'll go oh it's it's healthy he might he might yeah exactly there's nothing wrong with your eye but but it's not doing those things so we know what it's not doing and the neuro ophthalmologist might be able to give you a more detailed understanding of how to rehabilitate it okay I, yeah, one of my challenges, of course, because I stay away from digital as much as possible, I have Mm. started learning voiceover on my phone and on my Mac, Mm. Um, but uh, researching is slow going, but I did run across what you're talking about. So neuro optometrist, I think I definitely need to look into that uh, for sure and, and have, get them, have them take a look at me. It's a different level of specialist uh, yeah. practice, and therefore it's going to be probably more in line with what, with, with by whom you need to be looked at because the oft- optometrist is, not go- is going to say, well, this is what I see, but I don't know what the underlying cause is. And then as a result, right. I won't be able to guide it. So with my vision issues which were really based on sensory overload so if i was in crowds or a bright sunny day or even actually an overcast day sunglasses and a hat were my best friend for a long long time me too does it work do sunglasses uh minimize and a hat yeah to just uh so what I end up doing is I have the hat on so I can only see what's in front of me, mm-hmm. my sunglasses, and then I actually do a lot of kind of uh, softening my gaze. Mm-hmm. So uh, if I try to focus on something, that's when it mm-hmm. it hurts. So um, I'm basically walking around kind of dazed as it you know i mean i'm not mentally dazed yeah. but kind of have that look in my on my eyes if that makes any sense yeah i know the look i know what you mean uh and it does <laughs> it does help because it means that you'll you have more peripheral vision rather than m- more narrow vision and as a result the muscles are not as tense and tight exactly and, yeah and they're decreasing the stimulus Yes, it's so nice to have somebody understand. <laughs> yeah, um, stroke survivors understand completely what you're saying. There's a ton of people who I've interviewed who have vision issues uh, after stroke and uh, a number of different, well, I suppose not resolutions, but a number of different techniques to try and make it uh, more comfortable for them, I suppose. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I've tried twice that was unsuccessful um, is vision therapy. So the optometrist tends to recommend vision therapy, which of course is not covered by health insurance. Uh Um, But I tried it anyway, um, just because I was desperate. But uh, this second time around, my my pain was so bad that... uh, I couldn't, they couldn't even get me into the office. And that's, what's interesting. If I may tell you that I actually um, started working and getting back to work, doing this, this program that my doctor set up for me. And then um, two years later, this 
past April, um, my daughter had graduated and we drove to go see her graduate. And it was a lot of driving, which I have to keep my eyes shut in the car. Um, a lot of stimulation for graduation and stuff. Um, what ended up happening is, I don't know, it's like something broke and my vision hasn't been the same since then. Like it's not improving. Um, it's back to the way it was right after I had the stroke. And um, I don't know if I just pushed myself too hard, um, but I've had to start this recovery all over again. And because of that, I've ended up having to leave my my career, uh, which I absolutely loved. So that's what's happened recently. So I, I've kind of been going through two recovery starts. One, I thought it was kind of all over, but I pushed myself too hard, mm. it seems like. Mm. And I had to start all over again four months ago. That's interesting. So there is... Yeah. Uh... There is a lot of ups and downs with stroke recovery. You do get uh, to feel like, oh, yeah, things are going well, and then there's a lot of setbacks, and then you have to go again, and there's a setback, and so on. So there is a lot of that. I mean, it's probably similar to somebody who is going through sobriety. You have really good times, and then you have um, bad times, and then you kind of keep having to move towards the the good times, I suppose, or the or the positive i suppose but um it may it may not be that you push yourself there may be an underlying cause there might be something else okay that's triggered that and a lot of people will say that fatigue uh and overdoing things and pushing yourself sometimes does cause deficits to play up and to act up and to be worse so my deficits on my left side if i overdo things my left side gets really really numb and then it's really difficult to balance properly and i have to make sure oh. that i rest and sit down um but that usually is transient so by the next day if i've had a good night's sleep the deficits kind of go back to normal whatever that means they just <laughs> settle down a lot more um so the fact that it's your vision is kind of getting there and then it's sort of had a setback and it's not transient. It's not just a daily setback mm -hmm. and it's long. There might be an underlying cause. And that's why I reckon the neuro ophthalmologist will be somebody that might be able to provide some insight. Um, uh, yeah. Provide. Yeah. I mean, what do I know? But maybe they can help. Basically. No, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm, what, I'm, I swear tomorrow I'm going to give them a call because yeah. that's, I'm just constantly trying to, whatever suggestions I hear, not whatever suggestions I yeah. hear. I get a lot of people like, have you tried Botox? Have you yeah. tried? And I'm like, no, this is beyond Botox. This yeah. is, uh, I need specialists. So yeah. Of course, I appreciate everybody's suggestions, but I this neuro op ophthalmologist, yeah. right? Ophthalmologist. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of beyond okay. optometrist level. So, and they're yeah, they're they're a little bit more specialized. So, they are they are people who have a, a deeper understanding of that space and uh, more okay more stroke survivors who perhaps are listening that have vision issues may not know that that's who they need to speak to. They may not have been told you need to specifically see somebody who handles neurological vision issues, not regular vision issues. Yeah. Um, so for example, I went and saw a neuropsychologist after my stroke, my psychologist suggests that I go and see a neuropsychologist because the neuropsychologist understands how deficits in the brain cause certain symptoms and they can address them from a neurological perspective not from a behavioral perspective yeah yeah uh so one of the things that has happened recently in this second time around is uh 
I, I don't know if it's correlated with the pain in my head. Having chronic pain, I know, causes um, cognitive mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. but um, I I have been over the past three months, uh, depending on how bad the pain is, I'll start replacing words. I'll start uh, forgetting what I'm saying, uh, like mid sentence. I'll just it's like a TV turning off. I'll mm -hmm. be talking and then all of a sudden I'm like, I have no idea what I was saying, which is a normal thing that we start getting when we get older. This is this is uh, <laughs> exponentially happening, you know. Um, I started baking in recovery uh, because it's I'm searching constantly for things that I can do that don't hurt my head. And baking is one thing because uh, it's slow. It's not like cooking where I've got multiple burners going or something. It's, uh -huh. it's slow. And I had read about... Um, it being good for your brain. So I put on some classical music and I bake. And, um, but if I have, say, somebody baking with me and they're talking to me while I'm baking, mm -hmm. I can't do both things at one time. Yeah. I can't listen to what they're saying. And, you know, I'll do things like put the butter in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. I put, a measuring cup on top of the baking soda container as a lid, like things that don't make any sense. And it's just from trying to listen and do at the same time. So um, that's really where the neuropsychiatrist exam is, is going to come in and we'll see what's happening. Hmm. Okay. It looks like you're on to, a problem solving mindset anyway, like you're about trying to find solutions and you're seeing people and that's good. That's great because that's ultimately going to get you answers. Okay. That wasn't useful. All right. What's the next thing I can try and just keep going. Yeah. Down the path. And if it doesn't help, it doesn't mean it didn't help. It means that you have more information and now you can just go down the, the next path. Tell me about your baking. What do you bake? Uh, so we started off, we, meaning I invited some friends over because I was afraid to bake by myself. Um, just, I just couldn't even follow directions on my own. Mm. And that seems to be getting a little better. So I invited a couple friends over and we made pretzels, which turned out to be outstanding. And then uh, I made bagels with my niece. And uh, then I started making bread. So I've been making all kinds of different bread. I got the sourdough starter that uh, I think everybody names their sourdough starter. So mine's name is Ricardo. Uh -huh. and, <laughs> and so uh, I think cupcakes is this weekend. I'm going to make some fall cupcakes. So yeah, I, I am thinking about starting to find some cooking recipes. My boyfriend is Persian. So I'm thinking about maybe getting into cooking some things that don't require uh, you to move quickly. You know, uh, okay. that's kind of one step at a time thing. So oh. I'm going to look into that also. All right. I'm glad I heard that because what I'm going to do is I'm about to burst your bubble a little bit, not because I'm mean or nasty, but because of the fact that wheat based products are really not good for I know. <laughs> brain recovery. And if you're consuming a lot of wheat based products, you're probably doing your recovery a disservice. And okay, so that I'm not the one who has to hit you over the knuckles with the wooden spoon. Um, I'll just leave it at for Dr. David Pellmutter to do that through his book called grain brain. Okay. Okay. So I hear you. I went to a stroke survivor support group this week and they said the same thing. So that's two people telling me the same thing. That means I got to cut back and start making something else. <laughs> if there's anything I can encourage people to do is when they um, go on stroke recovery journey is that they need to dial in their nutrition. And one of those things that they need to stop is alcohol. Um, then they need to stop gluten, then they need to stop sugar, 
then they need to stop dairy and then caffeine. All those five foods, if they stop those, okay, what happens is uh, you get rid of the inflammatory responses that those foods create in the body. And if you've got a quote unquote normal brain, you're not noticing the inflammatory responses that are occurring. Your brain is more resilient and it can handle that kind of stuff. Some people do notice food comas and brain fog and fatigue and that kind of stuff and not being able to think straight. And that's a lot of the time related to food. Um, so then when you've got a stroke brain, you're, you, it's able to be irritated and put into those negative states far easier than it was prior. So okay. when people really struggle with fatigue, if they just cut out sugar and uh, gluten, they're going to have a massive positive improvement in their fatigue uh, scenarios and their deficits will not be as dramatic. So I noticed that from time to time when I go out to a party and there's some cake and I have to have a piece the the sugar and the the combination of the ingredients that make an amazing cake do impact my neurological ability and the way that I feel. And I can also feel the sugar coursing through my veins. I know that's strange and sounds weird, but I can I totally know that. I do too. Yeah. Like I can probably feel it. And and it's so bizarre. So um that, that's it from me as far as lectures go. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to make this about lectures. But yeah, it's just a bit of information that people don't know is important. And um, like I said, to get in, if you're a curious person like I was, and you get the book on audio, if you can't read it uh, with your eyes, if you get it on audio mm -hmm. by Dr. David Perlmutter, uh, it's a massive, amazing insight into uh, how not consuming those types of foods will improve your neurological health long term. Okay. So great. I'll do that. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. That's yeah. one thing that I enjoy doing that doesn't hurt my head. So yeah. yeah, that's a great recommendation. And make some awesome meals instead, some beautiful, you know, protein based meals with some veggies on the side and that kind of stuff. And yeah. yeah do that instead. It'll be lovely. Um so you've got a history of overcoming dramatic situations, right? It sounds like you're a bit of a, a fighter. And one of those things was alcoholism, but I feel like the alcoholism probably came from the other condition, which you mentioned, which was mental health challenges. Did I get the order right? Is that how it kind of came to be? Actually, the way that I think of it is, um, you know, I, I always thought that I drank because I had anxiety, because I was depressed, because I had a, you know, a bad marriage. Um, but I've realized in sobriety that I drank because I'm an alcoholic, because I have a disease. Um, the medication that I was taking for my mental health issues didn't work when I was trying to drink over, you know, trying to self-medicate with alcohol, my, um, my anxiety medication and all the other things that I was taking for panic attacks. Um, none of it was working. And um, it was, you know, alcohol was my best friend and it was really, really, uh, it was terrible to have to say goodbye. You know, that may sound weird to somebody who's not an alcoholic, but it was, um, it was devastating. But um, I, you know, they say one day at a time, I, you know, I had a couple starts on that, just like I had a couple starts with the stroke recovery. Um, I had gone to detox for alcoholism um, in 2015. And I just couldn't imagine spending the rest of my life without drinking. And I ended up drinking again a couple months later. And I drank for eight months until uh, my daughter 
you know, I was hiding it from everybody. Everybody knew, um, but I was drinking 24 seven at that point. And my daughter approached me and said, it's okay to try again. And um, it's taken a long time for me to be able to say that line without crying. But um, so I went back to detox and that time around, I decided I was gonna do whatever it took to get sober. Um, if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. And I've been able to pull a lot of parallels between my recovery from alcoholism, my program, and what I'm trying to do for my stroke. Um, I want the first step of, of putting alcohol down is recognizing that my life was unmanageable and I couldn't live like that anymore. And the same thing happened four months ago when I was trying to keep working, mm. you know, 10 hour days, sometimes 12 hour days, because I wanted to do my job and I wanted to be successful. And I had just reached the point where I was doing the thing that I wanted, that I had aspired to do. And, um, but, but I couldn't, my head hurt so bad. I, I couldn't live like that anymore. And I, sat out on my front porch and I just started crying and I was like, I can't live like this anymore. And I had to walk away. So I've had to do it twice. And um, like I said, I'm just really grateful that it's like my sobriety was practice so that I could prepare for how to live with my vision impairments mm -hmm. in a in a way that does not reignite all of my mental health issues wow that's an amazing way to get there so when you're an alcoholic are you functioning are you capable of driving and being at work and being in all sorts of normal places or not when I was actively drinking, is that what you mean? Or after? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I beg your drink. pardon. Yeah, the, uh, the terminology I'm not certain with. So, yeah, when you're actively <laughs> drinking. Uh, when I was actively drinking, um, I don't know. I, you know, I put people's lives at risk. I put my life at risk. I was drinking 24-7. Uh, the only time I wasn't drinking is when I passed out. And if I happened to wake up, I had a leftover glass of wine beside my bed that I would reach over, you know, nasty room temperature. And I would throw that down just to relieve any of the, um, the shaking and I would go back to sleep in the morning. I would wake up. I was nauseous. Sometimes I was throwing up and I would drink until I stopped throwing up. And then I would drive myself to work drinking on the way. Um, it got to the point where I just stopped showing up. I, I, I had a friend that passed away um, all of a sudden, and that was an excuse for me to just give up entirely, give up on everything. And, um, and I didn't go back to work after that. Um, and all it took was I ended up drunk, reaching out to um, who ended up being my boss at my job that I just left. 
Um, I reached out to him, didn't even know him. Um, reached out to him because I had his cell phone. I said, I'm an alcoholic and I need help. And my company, um, amazing. I'm so loyal to them. They, they helped me. I, they, they sent me flowers when I got out of detox, you know, like companies don't do that for people. Mm. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about, obviously about, the disease of alcoholism. And I'm just really fortunate that I had um, a company that was like a family to me and, and they stood behind me the whole way. And I ended up going from drinking in my cube, shh, don't tell anybody, to, um, to I was a, a director uh, within wow. seven years. So my whole life has changed since um i got sober how does somebody what not how but yeah well yeah how how do you drink for that long is it a, a slow start and it's i'm when you're 21 you have one drink and then by the time you're 22 you're having three how does somebody get to be able to drink i would imagine gallons of alcohol a day yeah, yeah. I so my drink of choice was Vela Chardonnay boxed wine. And uh I started, you know, I started drinking alcoholically from the moment I started drinking. Uh -huh. Um I one beer was never enough. When I was a teenager, one beer was never enough. I was gonna drink until there was nothing left. Um I, I never, as soon as I had alcohol in my system, I was all of a sudden confident. I felt like I was, you know, the funniest person in the room. I was the party. Um, and I went, I went to college and I was drinking every day in college. I was a math major. I don't know how I did it. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember my professor reaching out to me like a month before I was supposed to graduate. And she said, are you supposed to graduate this year? And I said, yeah, because um, I'm pretty sure I was failing her class. It was calculus five. And I never went to that class sober. My sorority at the time said that I was an alcoholic. And I thought that they were just mean girls calling me names. Um, I got married. I drank every day. I always drank every day. Um, until I started working at home for a family business. And that was when things started. It was more accessible. I could drink at noon, mm. you know, and then eventually I was drinking when I woke up. Um, I had that job at home for about 10 years and, uh, I, uh, sorry, my mind just went blank. I had that job for like 10 years. And so it took that long for me to start drinking uh, all day long. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I ended up losing that job <laughs> actually because when I had a business trip and I had to go to the main office, I would drink so much the night before that I wouldn't get up and show up to work. And so eventually they were like, we cannot have you, you know, you're a risk. Uh, yeah. So they, they, you know, they said goodbye, which is the comparison to the company that actually helped me. They mm. said goodbye, this company helped me yeah. get sober. And um, yeah, it's just some people, it's different for everybody. I got sober when I was 42. Some people get sober when they're 21. Um, mm. I, there, part of me wishes I got sober when I was 21 because I would have been more present for my kids uh, when they were growing up. My kids are off. They've graduated from college. They're off uh, building their own lives now. And I, I, you know, I learn in sobriety that I'm not supposed to have regrets. But um, 
if I were to have regrets, it would be that it would be Mm -hmm. not being present for them. But they say I'm they say I was a great mom anyway. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. Well, um, so do you feel like this is me trying to kind of get my head around what alcoholism is and how and how people get into it? And I know some people who are definitely alcoholics who (laughs) are in their 50s and have not admitted it. And they probably were alcoholics when we were 16 and 17 and we had just started drinking. Um, I feel like, is it like a personality trait that is a, has an addictive component? And if that's not the case, um, that's cool. Um, but then do many alcoholics need to switch their addiction to something else, which is more supposedly healthy? Healthy. It's so funny that you should ask me that. I, you know, what I've learned in my sobriety program is that alcoholics tend to um, be obsessive about things. And I absolutely have an obsessive personality. Um, I wouldn't call it obsessive compulsive, but compulsive, mm. uh, the diagnosed, you know, I just always need to be doing something. Mm. I need to, um, that's why it was so devastating to me walking away from my career because what am I supposed to do? You know, I was working every day. I was even working on the weekends. What am I supposed to do now? Um, well, I quickly started my podcast and, uh, and I started recording every single day and I, my friends were asking me, you know, how do you, and my family, how do you come up with something to talk about every day? And as I told you before we started this podcast, um, I don't interview anybody. It's just me running my mouth and Mm -hmm. it's because recovery is daily you know it I have something to talk about every day because I'm trying to live as a sober uh alcoholic who's recovering from a stroke I mean of course I have stuff to talk about every day Um, whether it's you know nutrition like what you're talking about which I'm epically failing at (laughs) <laughs> or um, trying to get a exercise habit, which I've just started um, doing yoga again. I used to do that every day. Um, that's been a challenge to try to figure out what exercise I can do that doesn't hurt my head because I used to run. I can't run now because the earth is moving and bouncing and I can't do that. So yoga is all about getting your drishki and so I'm doing yoga now. Um, I, I started sewing. Um, I grew up with my mom being a sewer and I thought, well, I can sew. That doesn't hurt my head. So what do I do? I'm, I made a quilt, you know, I made a quilt like right out of the gate, um, which I'm proud of, but it's just like, I can't stop. I can't slow down. And I feel like that is some sort of like underlying addictive personality that I have, which can be an asset. Like at work, I think Mm. it was an asset to the point where I always was, you know, I was on fire getting things Mm -hmm. done, but it can also be negative in that I can't stop. I'm working 10, 12 hour days um yeah you know so I try to balance and um so I I've learned a lot from again applying my sobriety program to this stroke recovery um to try to slow down I'm trying I just did a podcast on slowing down Mm. and um it's a it's meditation um, is a part of my sobriety program. So yoga, meditation, slowing down, I have to really actively apply those techniques in order to um, keep my brain healthy, take care of my brain. Yeah, 
I I really relate to your podcast title, Recovery Daily. The stroke is that for me every day. And the reason my podcast exists is because I need to talk about it more and more and more and more all the time. Because if I don't, exactly, it, it feels like it kind of builds up and then and then it's not healthy when it's built up. And of course, I, I can talk about it, all sorts of things for my wife and the people that I love who are around me all the time, but they don't necessarily want to have a stroke conversation every single day of their lives, you know? So, but, but stroke survivors who I meet once on a podcast, they don't mind talking about stroke. They, um, you know, this is a therapy session for me. Uh, every time I get to speak to somebody, exactly. About, you know, so yeah, I can understand how, uh, how recovery daily is the thing that you need to do. And that's small steps because you don't have to do a lot of recovery every day. You just have to do a little bit. And then that adds up over the week, over the month, over the year. And then you've come a really long way rather than just going and doing sort of uh, bursts of recovery and then sitting on your laurels and then doing nothing for a little while. I think it is better to do small amounts of daily recovery. And I still feel like I'm in recovery. And I've been doing this since 2012. And, um, wow. and it, it's an ongoing thing. It's a lifestyle now. It's how that's right. Do I go about yeah. maintaining my health and well being permanently? Yeah, that's what, um, you know, that's what I learned in sobriety is that this is a new way of life. And um, every morning I wake up and remind myself that I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. I used to wake up when I first got sober and thought, oh, I'm an alcoholic. Just like when I first had my stroke and I woke up and thought, oh, I can't see, you know? Mm. Um, I, this... These days, so ever since COVID started, I started going to a 7 a.m. sobriety meeting. Um, and I still, to this day, do that. So that's four years later, I think. We're at day, or week, uh, sorry, month four. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. year four, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. I, um, I go every morning at 7 a.m. to that meeting. I take the time to think about my recovery, think about um, what are, what is my role in my life? Am I carrying the ball? Am I, you know, am I engaging in my life today? Or am I sitting back feeling sorry for myself because I'm an alcoholic, because I had a stroke, because I can't, I can't drive my brand new car. <laughs> I can't drive it. I, no, I'm not going to do that because I know what it felt like when I was an active thinking every day. I knew what misery felt like, and I don't want to ever feel that way again. And if I don't take care of myself, even having had a stroke, I may drink again. And the reason why I started my podcast was because I woke up uh, in April, this past April, having had my symptoms re-engage, I, uh, I woke up and thought how much I wanted a muscle relaxer. That's what I felt like I needed for my mm. head. My head was like so tight and uh, and in pain, and I wanted a muscle relaxer. And I immediately sent a message to my brother and asked him to create a Spotify uh, podcast account for me because I have to share what's happening inside me so that it doesn't destroy me mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I end up drinking or taking some sort of mind altering drug. It's a way to keep you honest. That's right. I like it because that's why I do, I do the podcast. It's <laughs> because if I'm telling, I'm getting 8,000 downloads a month and if I'm, and it's going to about 50 countries or something, Rachel. And if I'm telling all of those people on a monthly basis 
not to eat wheat <laughs> and not to eat dairy. Well, I have to not eat wheat and dairy uh, as well as, <laughs> you know, I can't just tell people to do stuff without doing it myself. That'd be in, in well, it wouldn't be authentic, right? It wouldn't be nice. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why the podcast exists. It's to keep me honest and to keep me focused so that when I have a bad couple of days, because I record my podcast on the weekend, um, if I have a few bad days during the week, the podcast kind of breaks the cycle because we have to get here, inspire people, give people hope, encourage people, tell people what the journey looks like 10 years down the track, how things change and things get better and what you can achieve. So it, it breaks the entire negative cycle from say going into a fourth or fifth or sixth day. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an incredible way to be accountable for what you're saying. Uh, just like four days ago, I was talking about building habits and I had decided, you know, uh, at, in the episode, I'm going to start my habit of daily yoga. So I have to do daily yoga. Like I am 100% accountable, mm. um, to, uh, to doing that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, there are some days, you know, I do, I try to mostly be up. I, I am just naturally kind of a, a perky person, upli uh, uplifting kind of personality. Um, it's because of my sobriety program that I'm like that. I didn't used to be like that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are days that, you know, I have bad days. Life still happens when we're uh, in sobriety. Life still happens after you've had a stroke. And we got to figure out how to navigate it. And there are days that I have a episode that I cry and I don't re-record those episodes because if I'm truly being open, and honest about the stroke that I encounter in sobriety and in my stroke recovery, I want to actually show the authenticity of how hard it is on some days because that, uh, being vulnerable like that shows other people that they are not unique, you know, um, that somebody can relate to how I'm feeling. So um, that's what's important to me. That's another reason why I do it. I do it to keep myself sober and I do it so that if there's anybody out there who can relate to me, uh, that maybe I can help them too. Yeah. Brilliant. I, often tell people who tune in or who are on my podcast that recovery of it from stroke is three pronged. The three main pillars of recovery are the emotional recovery, the mental health recovery and the physical recovery. And I noticed that on your podcast, there's an episode there that talks about getting creative with emotional sobriety. What's what's that like how do you roll emotional the emotional side of recovery into sobriety how, how, how do you do that um yeah so i think that was a recent episode about uh creative coping if i'm thinking of the the same episode that you referenced um i mm -hmm. can uh i can't remember what it was called but um what i like to do so so just like you're saying, there's emotional, um, physical, and mental, and um, it's the same thing in sobriety, you know, we have to take care of our bodies, take away the alcohol, um, lots of my nutri nutrition, <laughs> aside from the bread, is really a result of taking the alcohol out. So here's the thing, you're going to cringe, but I'm going to show you anyway, I have this whole big bowl of blow pops because I took away the alcohol but yeah. um my sugar intake is uh has skyrocketed uh -huh. and it's something that uh that I don't beat myself up about because yeah. uh I quit drinking massive yeah. I would have drinking I quit smoking mm. um, 
I've smoked for, I don't even know how long and I entirely quit smoking. I'm like, I can totally have a blow pop if I want to blow pop, I you agree. know? Um, yeah. Um, so creative coping, um, what I've done is I've tried to, um, it's, it's kind of a building habit. So when I feel angry, I, uh, do pushups. That's my creative coping. It's a way to get the energy out. I tell my daughter all the time, who's very energetic, um, when you've got all these emotions and stuff, it's just energy and it needs to get out of you. And so one of the way I, ways I get my energy out is by talking in, on my podcast. The other way that I get my energy out is I do push-ups. Um, if I'm feeling like, uh, kind of spun up in my head, like wrapped around the axle, I'll do something like um, sewing, you know, focus on something or painting or one of these new hobbies that I'm creating. And um, so just trying to find different ways to attach link and emotion to an activity. Mm -hmm. um, because if I don't link that, then it just spins around up here and then it goes down into what I call my dark place. And that dark place was really full when I was drinking. And today I like to keep it nice and empty. Um, I also have this thing I call a God box. And um, I'm not terribly religious. I never have been. But as part of my program, um, we are to come up with a higher power of sorts. So I have my concept of what that is. And um, I have this box that when, uh, you know, I've my whole life, my mom used to say, let it go, Rachel, don't let it bother you. Mm. And I didn't know how to do. Um, so I needed some sort of action to correlate to letting something go. Mm. Otherwise, I didn't know how to do it. So when I get pissed off at somebody, I write their name down in the, on a sticky note and I put it inside the box and I shut the box. And that represents me letting thing go and because uh, I can't control people, places and things. So everything I do is uh, tied to an action um, and that keeps me mentally healthy, <laughs> at least uh, to a point. <laughs> I love that. It's actually extremely useful what you said. Not only did you tell me how useful it is and describe it, you are physically placing it out of the realm of your head into an external realm and away right. from you. And it's kind of done. That Therefore, it's been sort of dealt with. It's been taken out of your head in that moment. And then do that enough times. And then the habit becomes something that you do, even if you're not near the God box, so to speak. And That's right. Yeah, that's right. You're you're you're, uh, you're doing it imaginatively. You're using your mind to do it, and you're imagining. That's right. I've it. learned how to let something go. Yeah. Um. And I sometimes that. I just picture me putting it in the box. Yeah, I could do I could do with a box like that. I'm going to uh, <laughs> take take that and see how I can adapt it for my own uh, use because sometimes I do get stuck on the things that are just dumb and they're not worth getting stuck on and then it takes too long to unstick from them and then they just take up too much yeah. time and energy and effort and uh aggression and anger and all that sort of can come come up uh yeah stuck on something. and it's so, all about so. for me it's all about not picking up a drink not finding an excuse to drink yeah i hear you uh as we come to the end of the episode, I'd love to ask you about what you feel was the hardest thing about stroke. Uh, I think the hardest thing, you know, um, I still have a tendency to feel sorry for myself. Um, I, you know, in this last four months that I've had to leave my career, um, figure out what it is that I can do that makes me happy. 
um, that doesn't hurt my head. Um, I mentioned I just bought a new car and since April, I can't drive anymore. Um, it's, it's the hardest part is dealing with what's happening here and here. And That's off, the and hardest head. part. Um, I, one thing that I've encountered by going to different stroke support groups, which I've tried to tackle that the way that I tackle my sobriety fellowship, which is try to put myself in the position where I can talk to like-minded people. The exact reason why I reached out to you, because I wanted to be able to, you know, the more that I can get engaged with people in the community community the better I can um, grow here and here. And um, without, it, what I've learned is that there's so many people who have had a stroke that don't look like they had a stroke. <laughs> I didn't know that before I had the stroke. I thought everybody who had a stroke, you could tell they had a stroke. Mm. Um, but the more that I get involved in the communi community community, I'm learning that I don't know what the ratio is, but there's so many people who have impairments, have have these impairments that nobody can see. And it's so similar to, um, to our mental health, mm -hmm. to the illnesses that we hold inside us that nobody can see. That's been my battle my whole life. And, um, and so I don't know that it's it's going to change my life and that um, I have to work harder at my mental health. It's just that I'm going uphill right now and I'm climbing another mountain um, to figure out how I can navigate my life um, this new way of life, you know, this, I can't do the things I used to be able to do. And I find myself feeling very sorry for myself. Um, but if I keep talking to you and, and other people in the community, keep doing my podcast, um, I don't get stuck there. Mm. You know, I find that there's opportunity in our lives, no matter what no matter what we're up against, you know, I get really choked up about it because, um, because I, I keep fighting, you know, I just keep fighting and I've lost a lot of friends that couldn't fight anymore. Mm. And I, and, and for that reason, I'm fighting harder so that, um, I can share their story, share my story and um and do the best i can at um adding value to the world um as both a a, a recovering alcoholic and a stroke survivor mm. what has stroke taught you um it's taught me that no matter what's in front of me, I'm going to look for a solution. Yeah. I didn't know that I had that in me, but uh, I've, I've learned a lot about how freaking strong I am. I didn't, I had no idea that I was this strong. There's even, people who come to me and they're like, how are you doing it? I'm, I don't know. Even though you've been through sobriety and all the things that you've had to overcome, you didn't realize that you were strong until recently no you know i have to keep telling myself that might be part of my mental illness <laughs> you know mm. i have to keep telling myself that i'm strong mm. you are well the final question is about other people. What do you want to tell somebody else who might be along listening to one of these episodes comes across your one and 
and is kind of hoping to find out something new and encouraging what do you want to tell them about what the future holds or what what's important yeah uh i would want to tell whoever's listening that um you know life can seem like there's no way out that's that's how i felt when um when i reached my bottom when i was drinking i felt like there was no way i couldn't live my life without alcohol i felt like life was no longer going to be fun without alcohol and uh and i found out that life is actually more fun when you're present you can remember conversations and you have more energy to enjoy the world enjoy uh you know today i i can take a a walk with my dog around the block and i'll see a squirrel and it, i'm like my face lights up mm. because that's what the world does to me now and um it it didn't look like that the world didn't look like that when i was drinking and what's interesting is that as a as a stroke survivor um <laughs> i have a harder time looking at the world you know wow. i have a harder i can't watch a squirrel run across the grass but i have all of these snapshots that i've recorded over the past seven years of sobriety um and and so today i do a lot of looking inside mm. in order to find joy you know because we spend a lot of our lives searching for joy and what is it that brings me joy should i get married should i you know get a dog should i have a kid you know uh what I have found is, is the joy is found inside. It's not found out there. It's mm -hmm. found inside. And by going through, uh, all of these, this stroke recovery and all of that stuff, I've been able to get rid of all the trash and find it and find that joy. And I would just love for uh, anybody who feels hopeless to know that, um, it's in there. You just have to, you just have to dig and get it out, you know, uncover it. Wow. Well, on that note, thank you so much for being <laughs> on the podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Now, just before we do go though, uh, why don't you share with everybody where they can find you, uh, especially your podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so my podcast is available on Spotify and iTunes and YouTube and all of the platforms. And it's called Recovery Daily Podcast. And I also have a website, uh, recoverydailypodcast.com. And I've got social media, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. So you can find me in all of those places. And it's me. It's just me. Uh, so if you reach out to me, I'd love to talk to you about your experiences and, and share mine and, and we can continue to grow this community that um, keeps us all healthy. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. Remember to grab your copy of chapter one of the book, The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened by visiting recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. Take a look around and discover what the book is all about and click the download free chapter button. As always, to learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. Thank you to all the people who have already left a review. It means the world to me and you are helping others in need of this type of content to find it easier and that is making a massive difference in their recovery. If you haven't left a review yet and would like to, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. 
If you are watching on YouTube, definitely comment below the video. I love seeing your comments. I will respond to all of the comments on the YouTube channel. So please do that. Like this episode and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. Thank you once again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you and see you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.